the Upanishad series. What are Upanishads? There is a difference between Upanishads and other scriptures. It relates to a question. What is the difference between religious scriptures like the Gita, the Quran, the Bible and the Upanishads? The Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, the Bible, these come in the category of scriptures. Upanishads are not. Upanishads are not religious scriptures. Instead, they are poetic expressions of those who have known. These are the hidden parts of the Vedas. There are four Vedas, Atharved, Samved, Rigved and Yajurved. Some of these Upanishads form the part of Atharved, some Samved and so on and so forth. It happened a particular sage is speaking to his disciples. Just as I am speaking to you, in the same way there used to be communes in the forest. A sage is sitting under the tree, surrounded by his disciples. Disciples ask a question. And the question used to relate to one particular theme. And whatsoever he says, he says out of his experience, his interaction with truth. He shares with his disciples, answers their questions. And these statements of truth, on one theme came to be known as scriptures and came to be known as Upanishads. For instance, whatever Upanishad we take, let's take for example Kaivalya Upanishad. Kaivalya means liberation. In that this sage Lord Parmeshtis communing. Ashulana is one of the disciples. He is already enlightened, awakened. Yet still he wants to know more about truth. So he, uh, he approaches the sage to know more about truth. And he explains to him that forms the part theme of Kaival Upanishad. Similar is the case where six disciples approached the sage to know more about truth and each one of them had asked a question. In response to those questions, the sage shared his experience and these came to be known as another Upanishad. A king was performing a yajna and when a sacrificial act is performed, gifts are to be given to the Brahmins and all other people who gather in the yajna. So the king had a young son, his name was Nachiketa. So he realized his father is donating the cows, but he is stingy. Instead of giving the young and fresh cows, he is donating the cows which are no more capable of giving the milk. He objects to that and ask the father, why are you giving these cows which are of no use? 
Father is performing his yajna and a little child is asking him, pestering him with these questions. He gets, and then he also inquires, in the yajna all that belongs to you has to be donated. So he inquires a question, Father, who are you giving me to? The cows you are giving to the sages and who are you giving to me? Me too. When again and again this question was pestered, the father got angry and he said, I am going to give you to the Lord of death. And he becomes very happy. At least I am going to be donated to Lord of death. I can inquire many questions. This forms the theme of Kathopanishad. This is how these are the statements, not religious scriptures. They are poetic expressions of those who have known. I am speaking to you where the words are emerging and why these words have an effect that in Sufi terminology is known as Tawajjo, a flow of energy that continuously flows through these words and reaches you. And maybe sometimes it may put you in a state of intoxication. The words become alive. You listen to the other words, you listen to these words, simple, ordinary words, poetic expression. These are the statements of the truth, the experience of oneness, the experience of bliss within. These are the statements or expressions of ultimate by those who have experienced them. And that is why these are called as Upanishads. They are not Hindu. Although I am speaking to you because my outer appearance is Hindu, the name is, but that is the upbringing. But my understanding is neither Hindu nor Muslim nor Buddhist. Instead it is total. Truth is not Hindu, Muslim or Christian. Truth is simply true. They are not Hindu. They are not Buddhists. They are not Jain. In fact, they do not belong to any religion. These are the experiences of the individuals sitting at the feet of their master and when they experienced overwhelmed them, they danced, they sang, they uttered strange statements and these were not made by their mind. It was almost it was almost as if they were just hollow bamboos. Existence had made them float. It was existence itself singing its song through them. The float is empty within and when something is empty within and air is blown into it, a melody happens. It was existence itself singing a song. That is why no Upanishad carries the name of its writer. There is no copyright issue. Quran belongs to Holy Prophet. The New Testament belongs to Jesus. Bhagavad Gita belongs to Krishna and Dhampad belongs to Gautam Buddha. 
Ishavasya Upanishad belongs to no one. Indeed, it belongs to no one. They were tremendously courageous people. They have not even signed their names. In fact, it would have been ugly to sign because they were not the writers. They were not the composers. They were not the poets. The poetry was coming from ever, from beyond, and they were simply the empty vehicles. Mirza Ghalib says, Aate hai ye mazami khayal mein ghaib se These thoughts, these words, emerge from an unknown realm. I have no control over it. There is a beautiful story about Rabindranath Tagore. He, a poet, is like a pregnant woman. When he feels the pangs within, he knows that it is time for delivering the child. Ravindra used to lock himself into the room. He will not eat. Nobody knows for how long he will remain locked into the room, two days, three days. And like a mad person, he goes on writing. Goes on writing as the thoughts emerged. The poetry is being delivered through him like a baby is delivered, like a child is delivered through a pregnant mother. This is how the Upanishads happened. Rabindranath is the only poet who comes very close to being enlightened one. He will simply go and lock up himself into the room and as he locks up into the room many things will begin to happen to him and you will find that he has not come out of the room. These his words are the glimpses which cannot be composed. Yes, these have happened. And in reality, he never composed these. Whether you look at Gitanjali, he did not compose. Whenever he felt, just as a pregnant woman feels the presence of the child in the womb, a real, authentic poet feels like that, pregnant with something that is beyond him. Whenever he felt pregnant with a poem, a strange statement, pregnant with a poem. You have never heard the word pregnant with a woman? Pregnant with a poem? He would close the door, inform the people of the house that he is not going to be disturbed. Whatever happens, even if the house is burned, he is not to be disturbed. Nobody would knock at his door. And sometimes it would happen that it would take two days, three days, he would not eat, he would not come out of the room. Madly he was writing something that was not, that was going on within him. And he will figure out later on what it is. First he has to, first it has to be transported to the world of language. And then whatever grammatical arrangements or mistakes he has to clear, he will do it. When his friend YB Eats asked Ravindra to translate Gitanjali into English language because basically it was written in Bengali language. Gitanjali means an offering of flowers. He was not very well 
words in English language. So he asked his friend Romeo Rolla to translate it into English, but he was not a poet. He translated it. At one point, he used a word which Ravindra found was not good. He sent it. Eats read it. And exactly at the same point where Ravindra did not like the use of the word by Romeo Rolam, he mentioned that change this word because Eats was a poet. He could understand the overflow of the message and that's how the translation of Gitanjali was corrected and presented. So he will lock himself into the room and when he was finished with it, you will be surprised that he would weep. Tears would come out of him profusely. It was a relief and a joy that he had been able to bring from the unknown a few fragments. But he would cry and tears would be on his face because it finished so soon. To be in that state with such a beauty, such a benediction, such a bliss and he never wanted to come out of that state. And this is how most of his poems were written. It is the poetry coming from above, from beyond, they were simply the vehicles, so there was no need to write a name. Because of this, you will be surprised to know that the whole of the Quran consists of Hazrat Muhammad Wasallam's statements. Bhagavad Gita contains the statements of Krishna, but each Upanishad contains consist of many masters expressions anybody has reached to that state of beyond and allowed beyond to descend through him his statements form the part of Upanishads Upanishads have not bothered to collect the words of one person each Upanishad contains the words of many enlightened masters and without any signature. Words have never been so golden. Words have never been taken such high flights. And yet people who allowed them to happen have remained anonymous. This is so beautiful, immensely beautiful, because they knew that we have nothing to do with it. We have just been the passages. Something has come through us. One Upanishadic Rishi once shared the name of course is unknown, is reported to have said, if there is any mistake in my statement that is mine and if there is any truth, I cannot claim that it is mine. The truth belongs to the universe. Mistake belongs to me that I was not such a good vehicle. These were the rare people, unique human beings indeed the very salt of the earth. I would like you all to become the very salt of the earth again. It is because these are not religious scriptures. That is why there is no religious following. There is no religion following the Upanishads. These are very few books which contain the greatest quality of truth and have remained unorganized. There is no organization around them. Certainly there can not be. 
because of the very methodology this cannot there cannot be a church or a pope or a shankaracharya established around it i love someone but i cannot make an organization out of it and when i leave this body i will leave in heritage my wealth my house my land everything but i cannot leave my love in heritage i cannot leave my love in heritage these upanishads are pure love so there have been no successor no priest no follower these books are the most are the purest in the whole world absolutely without any pollution they have remained just the way they were expressed nobody fought because of the upanishads mohammedans have fought because of the quran hindus have fought because of the bhagavad gita christians have fought because of the new testament everyone has been fighting for their scriptures but who cares about these poor upanishads but it had been fortunate that nobody has bothered about them they have remained as pure as they were when they were first given birth to as innocent as ever there are 112 upanishads the statements in the upanishads cannot be made into dogma for the simple reason that the statements are not rational and logical they are contradictory truth is always contradictory how can truth be contradictory truth supposed to be logical but it is never logical let's truth is an expression in a moment this is the moment you call someone and you say i am thirsty i am thirsty this is the truth in that particular moment someone brings the water for you you drink it your thirst is quenched but another person hears it but he was doing something after you have drank the water he brings the water he says i brought the water for you you say i am not thirsty but the person said i heard you ask for the water that you are very thirsty now is it not a contradiction he says i was thirsty then but i am not thirsty now truth is an expression in a moment it is the two statements are right i am thirsty it is expression in the present moment you cannot make it a past that i was thirsty then but i am not thirsty now when the statement was made i am very thirsty and again the statement is made i am no more thirsty this is illogical irrational one upanishad says i do not know who created the world you cannot make a religion on such a statements i do not know who created the world then what do you know that is going to be the basis of any religion the belief in god the belief in creation but like an innocent child the upanishadic seer says i do not know who created the world and this is closer to truth nobody knows who created the world nobody knows whether anybody ever created it it may have always been there and it seems most 
scientific that it has always been there and will always be there. The whole idea of creation is stupid. But if you drop the idea of creation, you have to drop the idea of the creator, the God. Then you have to drop the idea of the priest, the pope, the prophets, the messiah, the saviour and the reincarnations of God too. There is no God, then from where the reincarnations happened. I have heard a crazy man had applied to be given a job on a ship. He was in tribute. The captain and the high official of the ship asked him if the ocean is in turmoil and there is danger to the ship, what are you going to do? He replied, that is very simple. Whenever a situation like that happens, they drop heavy loads by the side of the ship to keep the ship anchored and those heavy loads are called anchors. So the man said no problem. I will drop a big anchor. The captain further in. But if another great storm turmoil comes because these things happen in a chain a great way. What are you going to do then? The man responded, I would drop another anchor. And if third one comes, another anchor. And if the fourth one comes, another anchor. At this, the bewildered captain said, Stop. First tell me, from where are you getting all these anchors? Very simply, the man replied, Just as you are just as crazy as I am, from where are you going to get all these turmoils? From the same place that you are getting these turmoils, one after the other, I am going to get the anchors. One fallacy, one false statement, one fictitious idea gives birth to another fictitious idea. First you ask who created the world. Immediately God comes in as the first end. But nobody is bound to ask who created God. Immediately the second anchor comes, definitely a bigger God might have created a smaller God. But the question cannot stop. You have started a fictitious thing and now there is no way to stop it. You will have to go on creating bigger and bigger Gods. The Upanishads are not religious scriptures. They do not give you any belief system. They do not tell you to believe in anything. They do not have any God. They do not have any reaction. No reaction or whatsoever it is. All that they have is deep harmony between the master and the disciple. And that harmony brings peace serenity and tranquility. That all questions in that serenity, in that peace vanish. Not that you found an answer. Not just all questions disappear. But the harmony is so much. The peace and serenity that in that the questions dissolve. The question of finding an answer does not arise. You do not have any question, how can you have an answer? When you come to such a company of the awakened one, where there is a constant brewing of the 
peace, the bliss, the nectar. You forget all about your questions, your questions vanish. And when questions vanish, there is no need for answers. So the Upanishads do not have any answer for anyone. That is why people have not taken much note of them. Because they do not have any answer for you, you have questions, you want answers. The Upanishads do not have any answers. They are ready to take you into a different dimension of existence to transmute you. It is a change of consciousness and suddenly all the doubts, all questions, everything disappears and what is left behind is just a beautiful peace. Hence every Upanishad ends with prayer. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. The word Shanti means absolute silence. Beyond the silence there is nothing. The end has come. There is no need. It brings total contentment, absolute blissfulness and ultimate ecstasy. The Upanishads are the only free, absolutely free books as far as religious scriptures are concerned. There is all religious books are imprisoned. Nobody has dared to imprison the Upanishads for the simple reason that those Upanishads are of no use as far as priesthood is concerned, creating organization is concerned, exploiting people is concerned and giving false belief is concerned. Those Upanishads are dangerous. It is better to keep them aside. You can use Bhagavad Gita, you can use the Bible, the Quran, the Ramayana for your purpose and business was certainly not the Upanishads. A moment a book becomes a holy scripture, it becomes poisoned. Then it is nothing but a strategy to make more and more slaves. A Hindu slave, a Christian slave or others. The Upanishads cannot be condemned for doing any ugly thing to humanity. They have given their fragrances. They have blossomed, they have shared their joy with such beauty and clarity, yet without any loopholes, so that it is impossible to make them religious scriptures. They are only truly religious, they are not scriptures, they are truly spiritual. In the whole history, there are only a few books which have remained uncontaminated by the cunningness of the human mind. Upanishads are a few such books that remained uncontaminated in their purest form as devices for transformation, a pure poetic expression of the experience of these sages.